So Casper, thank you for being with us today. Uh, what would you say is the biggest opportunity and challenge for Henkel today? I think for Henkel, but also for many other global companies, is how do you actually get growth back into the system? And that's also the opportunity because that comes through globalization. So in a market environment where global GDP growth is around 2.5%, that's the sum of the average, or that's the average. That means that some are growing not at all and some are growing very high. So the point is, how do you get to a much higher growth than the GDP growth? And you can only do that by readjusting your footprint. So it's a huge opportunity to become more global. But at the same time, for a lot of Western companies, it's a very, very large challenge because their home markets are growing next to zero. So how do you deal with the maturity in these old markets, if I may say, the European market, for example, or Japan? Or I think you have to look upon them uh, with a mindset that while you have no growth or limited growth in the market, you have to find growth through innovation. So innovation can be a growth driver in those markets. That's one. And the second part, which is a big opportunity, is that a lot of decisions are still being made in the mature market but executed, so to speak, in the emerging markets. So it's important to understand that in a global market, in a global world, sales decisions are made in one country, but very often executed in a different country. And the mature markets still have an enormous impact mm -hmm. on the growth that's actually taking place in the emerging markets. So it would be a big, big uh, I would say, uh, mistake if one were not to focus on the mature markets, because by doing so, you would actually forego growth of the emerging markets. So we live also in a world where, you know, some people will say there is over communication. At the same time, you know, we have social media, we have new technology. The world is becoming more complex, uncertain, volatile. What what would be your advice to business leaders to, in a way, better communicate and be more engaged with the different stakeholders? See, I think that most companies actually communicate from a volume standpoint, mm -hmm. potentially too much but not clear enough. And I think part of the issue is the lack of clarity in what companies are saying. And the clearer you can be in, in, certain, in certain ways, actually the more simplistic you can be and more consistent, you can, simplistic and consistent you can be in your communication, the better it is. We also make use of social media, all kinds of platform, but we try to repeat the core messages of our company around strategy, strategic in uh, intent, vision and values over and over again in order to make certain that we leave the stakeholders with a very clear picture of whom we are. That means when it goes well, we say it goes well, but it also means when it doesn't go well, that we also say it doesn't go well. So become transparent around what we're doing, but keep a very, very clear, and to a certain extent, simple party line all the time. So what you're saying is that you have to be simple, focused, and you have to repeat the yeah, message. Repeat it all the time, but also be what I call intellectually honest. Right. So what I mean by intellectually honest is when things doesn't go well, you have to say it's not working well. Because I think unclarity is very often taking place when communication is either too complex or actually it's not clear enough. Today, um, many companies and brands are being attacked uh, via the you know, social media, the internet. Well, what's the best way for you to protect the reputation of your companies and your brand? I think the best way of protecting yourself is being um, authentic to whom you are. Mm -hmm. And authenticity is created through vision and values. I know this is very easy to say, but I actually really do believe that the older companies have gotten old, and old f for good reason. They've been very true to who they are and who their heritage is. Being old doesn't mean you can't be modern. Mm -hmm. they don't, they're not in contrast, but I think actually if you're very, very clear to the external world and to the internal world is what is your strategy, what is your vision, what is your take on your values, and how do you live your values, I think they bring enormous amount of protection to you, company, in a volatile world. Because as a global company, you'll always be under attack externally or internally also because you have a very large community of people and your company represents the society you conduct business in. But the best way of influencing your own society is through a very consistent, quote unquote, preaching of your value set in your company. So what do you accept as behavior? And also, what doesn't, don't you accept as behavior? And your value set is a subset of regulation. It's not beyond regulation, it's actually a, you know, a subset of what regulation is. 
I understand that you have done this exercise recently at Henkel. You revisited your vision and values, and by the way, you simplified it, right? You had kind of 10 keywords. And so can you tell us a little bit more about you know, what you have done in terms of revisiting your vision and values, and, and, and maybe start by the first question, say, why did you do that? We didn't. We did it because we didn't feel that we have clear, we had clarity of point one strategically where we wanted to go, and two very clearly that our employees globally didn't know our values, and th and those who did interpreted our values differently. We had too many; they were too complex, and it created a um, I would say uncertainty whom we are, and to a certain extent dissatisfaction. So we went back and did over one year a thorough exercise of what do we believe is important for us as a company, what do we stand for, and what defines our behavior. And based on that, we defined four value, five values with very clear, very simple sentences. We've taken every single employee through these values. The values are represented in the way we actually evaluate and eventually pay our people. Mm -hmm. And we hire and fire people based on our values. So we put the values at the very center of what we do. It's not just something that we have on a piece of paper that we put on the wall. It de defines when we do managed meetings what the agenda should be. It defines when we go to country visits how we are. It defines how we should behave. And what we do do is we're very clear on even strong financial performers in our company. If they don't live up to our values, they cannot be in our company. So we're actually quite rigid about it. We also convinced that over time, we will actually have a higher level of employee satisfaction because we are creating a much higher level of, um, of certainty. What are we all about? And reversely, what are we not all about? For instance, that means that if we buy another company tomorrow, we don't go out and say, we'll do best of both. We are saying, this is what Hinkle is. Our vision is a global leader in brains and technologies. We have our five values and we'll say, here are our five values and you have to comply to those. And if you say, I only like three and not five, we say in our, in our kitchen, we only have Coke, we don't have Sprite. And you, can't, you don't have the choice. So if you, only, if you only want three, then you can't be part of the family. And I think being very, very true to what you want to be or who you are makes you also predictable internally and externally. And I think that protects you as a company. What do you think are the new skills that global leaders need to have for the next coming five, 10 years? Being a global leader is actually quite, I would say, difficult mm -hmm. because it requires you to a high extent uh, to understand very different cultures and make certain you can operate in different cultural environments and bridge across them and look upon quality sets within individuals and leaders in those countries and not judge them by the same standards all the time. So if you go to China, a person that has taken his or her education in China will have a different background, will behave differently than the person who has taken his or her education in Western Europe. So you've got to figure out how to actually look for competences, but where some of the behavior is different. So, so there is a cultural sensitivity uh, that you have to look for, the cultural understanding, because you need to have a certain amount of cultural understanding. And that means that you, as a global leader, in my opinion, needs to prepare, be prepared to do an enormous personal investment in spending time in those countries. You simply cannot be a global leader if your internationalist experience is two weeks of Mallorca holiday every summer. You have to live in the countries, you have to be in the countries, you have to have a network in the countries, you have to understand why the countries develop and behave the way they do, and you can only do that by physical presence. So global leadership, my uh, opinion, means that you have to be where the market is and global leaders can't run their company from a Germany or from a Japan or from a US or from a Denmark, for my sake. You have to be in those countries. That's a very, very different management style because I think only so can you actually build trust on one side, but also build your own understanding of how those markets and those people develop and behave. Well, thank you very much, Casper, for this great insight. Really thank appreciate you very much. it. Thank you.